All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we are talking. Uh, we are going to talk about financing environmental shift, and our guest, special guest, is Professor Stefan Brunberg. And you've got a lot, a lot of uh, functions. So the, I will mention just a few: Lancet Commission, Club of Rome, Federal Council of Sustainable Finance in Germany, World Academy of Art and Science. Thank Welcome. Thank you for having me in your show. <laughs> interesting discussion on this important topic. So we, we've got the, so we are going about financial aspects of environmental shift and um, how do you think, how can we achieve environmentally oriented society and economy? Who is in charge and probably the more important even who should finance this shift? Okay, let's, let's zoom out for a minute. <laughs> You know, um, you can look at it from a historical perspective. In 1972, the Club of Rome published Limits to Growth. This was kind of a triggering report to make the environment an awareness for the entire society and the political decision process. But throughout the last 50 years, we were able to discuss almost everything in order to achieve the shift you were just mentioning from fossil to green, right? Uh, we were able to discuss almost everything but one component. And the component we've been not discussing is the architecture and the structure of the financial system, meaning the architecture and the structure of the money system itself, enabling or hindering us towards a sustainable future. And for me personally, this is the reason why we're not achieving very much on a global level, because we change technology, we change governance, we change lifestyle, but we change demographic standards like population politics, uh, but we do not change the financial ecosystem within which all these decisions are going to happen and all these decisions are enacted in one way or another. Well, how do you think it has happened? Why we I, didn't, know, didn't it, really touch the, the financial issue? Is it so difficult or? No, I think, you know, look at, look at Polish textbooks in economics, <laughs> look at Western textbooks in economics and American textbooks in economics. Money is considered to be a neutral veil. Money is considered to be like a thermostat. You put it in the water and you just measure the temperature, like measuring the price. But in that perspective, money is considered to something that doesn't affect the allocation of goods and, cap goods and services and capital. It only measures it. And this perspective is fundamentally flawed and fundamentally wrong. Money is not a neutral thing. And money is not a natural law either. Money is a rule, is a convention, like accounting standards. But the entire money system is a convention or a club rule or like a marriage contract. You engage and if it really doesn't work, you disengage and re you readapt by applying new rules. And we've been considering over the last 50 years the money system as basically being neutral, where finance drives and has been driving sustainability over the last 50 years. And any time there was no money available, no sustainability outcome was possible. We have to change our mindset towards the opposite. It's not finance driving sustainability. It's actually sustainability able to f drive finance and coming up with the right financial incentives, the wise and clever financial engineering between the private and the public sector enabling us to finance our common future. So how do you see the role of the financial market in the shift to economically oriented economy? 
ecologically, sorry, yeah. environmentally. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just coming back from COP27, from Sharm el Sheikh, and we've been discussing that topic at the, at the third day, which was the finance day. And my experience is that the private sector is in the driver's seat. They are ready to spend not only the billions, they're ready to spend the trillions of dollars and euros and slotties all over the world in order to shift from brown to green, in order to integrate social and environmental issues, in order to shift towards a brighter future. But, now comes the big but, in order to mobilize the trillions of the private sector, we need hedging instruments that de-risk to some extent funded by the public sector the uncertainties and risks associated with major investments in that field. You know, if you have to invest into Africa, uh, Sub-Sahara, if you want to invest into Asia or South America, the capital costs are by far higher than anywhere else. Can I give you an example? Look, if uh, Western Africa has a lot of sun and a lot of wind, like Indonesia has a lot of sun and a lot of wind. But most countries there are still based their energy consumption and energy supply on fossil industry. And you can ask these politicians and the academics, why don't you shift? You have a lot of sun, much more than in Poland, and a lot of wind, much more in Poland and Germany. They say, well, it's clear. The capital costs for implementing a wind turbine is up to eight times higher than what you pay in Germany for the same technology. Why should I, let's say I'm the Minister for Environmental Affairs of a Western African country, why should I shift to a wind-driven energy supply if I have to pay eight times more and nobody finance that shift? This is far too dangerous, far too adversive. So I'm taking this example to demonstrate that if we want that shift, African countries know how to build windmills. They know how to set up solar panels on their roof. But if you have to pay eight times more, we have to come up with financial instruments that hedge and de-risk exactly these differences. Can you achieve this with a present financial system? No. Then? No. In a short, no. This is impossible. So I don't think we can achieve that within the time frame we're giving each other and within the volume required within the given system. You know, the given system is basically um, either philanthropy and charity. You call up a billionaire and say, can you give me some money? Okay, as a gift. <laughs> it's fine if you get a gift, but you cannot build a world economy is not a gift economy, right? And shifting from brown to green is at the end of the day, it's fine to have a gift, but it should work with the comparative revenues and competitive advantages associated to it. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? And the second source of um, finance and liquidity is tax money. So you basically create a value chain. At the end of the value chain, you tax the value chain and they withdraw some liquidity and take that liquidity to finance environmental or social issues. And if you look really into the data and crunch the data, and you're experts in data crunching, much more than me, you should admit that the amount of money you can get through a taxation schema and the amount of money you can get to philanthropy or charity are in volume and speed not enough to finance that shift. So it should be like on a regular basis that there should be investments available for, for this uh, environmental shift. But uh, 
we've got this taxonomy yeah. uh, uh, based on, on uh, <coughs> European Commission project. Uh -huh. How would you assess this? How do you assess? Uh, we are involved in the, at the German uh, government, at the Federal Council on sustainable finance on that topic, on transformative finance and its associated taxonomy. You know, if you look at this, this it's about ESG, right? It's environmental, social and governmental issues that should be uh, internalized into the company's balance sheets, then creating different portfolios and then finally creating different a spread between the goods and the bads, right? This whole debate about ESG is 25 years old. It just got labeled in 2004, 2005 with the ESG criteria. And you know, ESG is frankly like if you have three kids, right? An E, an S, and a G. Which one of the three, if you run the company, if you run the family, which of the three you like most? You know, it's really tough. Right? At the end of the day, it's a, it's a moral imperative. You have to make a decision towards one or another because a, as a company, you normally cannot achieve all of them. Right? <clears throat> but it is a wicked problem. On one side, I agree, as you as a specialist in accounting, that we need some sort of taxonomy which is reliable and standardized and scalable. Right? That's clear. <laughs> On the other side, it basically will increase the costs for the corporates by a factor two to three, right? This is the amount of money we have to spend on top of it. And who is going to pay that? Customers. Uh, the customers in the private sector in one way or another, right? <clears throat> but if you even look at the metrics, meaning if you look at the different taxonomies available and you try to match them, there is about 600 metrics. And they have an overlap of about 10%, roughly. And CO2 is not part of the 10%. So there's a lot of metrics out there which do not even consider global warming as part of their taxonomy. And on top of it, the inter-rater reliability, which is supposed to be 95, 97 in order to create a robust result, is less than 50%. Meaning what you're getting is very low output with very high costs. If we take that argument one step further, <clears throat> um, I would say we need a taxonomy. We need a taxonomy in the sense of an inventory. And, okay? It's kind of an accounting inventory that tells us where are the costs, how much is going to cost? Let's document that, let's standardize that, and then let's get, come up with the so-called total cost analysis of the entire process, upstream and downstream. Once we have done that work, which is basically your work, the question, who is going to pay that bill up front, is a different question than the question of the taxonomy. And you have three options. The first option is you don't care. Okay, you have a taxonomy, but you don't price it in. The second option is, this is the main option which is currently under discussion is, we internalize these costs in the private sector, right? It's basically, economically speaking, like a, a hidden tax. It's a shadow tax. You add on top of specific products in your balance sheet, which increases the price on one and decreases the price on others, right? You differentiate according to ESG standards, right? And at the, at the end of that value chain, you basically come up with an investment strategy with which is going to increase the price and the taxpayer has to pay the bill in one way or another. But <clears throat> this is not the full story. I think if we are smart, we take that taxonomy and acknowledge the fact that a substantial part of the ESGs cannot be privatized. They cannot be fully internalized into a corporate sheet because 
They are systemic. It's a systemic risk, a systemic uncertainty. We cannot fully internalize. We can partly internalize, but not fully. So what are we going to do with the rest? We cannot internalize. I think here, again, the public sector plays a role. The public sector has to partly, partly step in in order to cover parts of the inventory, of the costs we've created in the first place, in order to allow the private sector doing its job. You know? So, but, but if you are talking about the public sector, but yeah. which public sector? I mean, and which how, country? And, 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 how, and how? How the public sector should finance this shift? When I'm talking about public sector in this field, I'm talking about public finance. I'm not talking about domestic finance, right? Within the EU, I'm talking about monetary policy. I'm not talking about fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is basically a domestic sovereign rule. You decide, as a Polish country, um, how much your VAT is, how much your income tax is, etc., right? Monet but Monetary policy, especially within the EU area, in the Euro area, is happening in Frankfurt. Right? Monetary policy decides how much money, how much liquidity is created in order to solve the future shocks. And what we are going to discuss later in the lecture is exactly that. When we are now in the era of the Anthropocene, that's what it's called, where we have huge amount of uncertainties. And you know from economics that we have to differentiate between uncertainties and risks. We can quantify risks and put a price tag on it and can internalize them into a balance sheet, into accounting and reporting. But we cannot fully quantify uncertainties. Uncertainties will remain part of the system's instability, built in the way any complex system is built. Also the financial system, all the economic system, the environmental system, the social system, what, whatsoever. Meaning, if you want to tackle with uncertainties, not with risks, we need to come up with smart financial instruments that link the public and the private sector not only through fiscal policy, but through monetary policy. And central banks are able to create that additional liquidity to partly hedge and fund and manage, not fully, partly, parts of the systemic uncertainties we cannot fully privatize. If you put that, if you take that argument even from a historical perspective, you know, in the 90s, 1990, 92, 93, with the Washington Consensus, we started privatizing the entire world, right? With all the goods and bads. Rather, the, we now rather see the bads. We deregulated, we liberalized, and pr privatized the world, especially the, the public sector, you know, the water sewage system, energy system, here in Poland too, all over the world. And now we see a reverse trend where we start internalizing all these costs. But now we do the do the same mistake again by privatizing the entire systemic costs, the entire social and environmental externalities we've been creating all over the places, all over the world, into the corporate world. And we will see if we do that at the end of the day, accounting firms are going to make a lot of money, but the real economy, the real economy, is going to suffer in a way that it's also partly unfair by internalizing and privatizing the entire sum of uncertainties. Let's stay, take, gets very concrete now. Let's take uh, the impact of CO2 in the atmosphere. Who should pay the bill? Aramco? Volkswagen? You? Me? My kids? In part Aramco, in part Volkswagen, in part you and me and my kids, but in part also because it's a common global good. It's a common global externality. 
which you cannot fully internalize at Aramco. You cannot fully internalize at Volkswagen. And you cannot fully internalize and privatize it on a taxpayer, citizen level. You need the public sector, the public finance sector, here and here in specific, the monetary sector to step in and par partly hedge parts of the uncertainties. I know it's a complex topic, you know, but... Um, but yeah, but, but the, I, I think that what I find here interesting is, uh, okay, we can see that part of the issue should be financed by the private market, but mm -hmm. not no more than what part. Uh, if you've got 100% is needed for... 100%, 50%. Well, it depends on the project. You know, look mm -hmm. at the data. Uh, UN SDGs as a, as a roadmap, a third of the UN SDGs can, are eligible for private investment, roughly. Two thirds are not. Two thirds are basically global comments, like air pollution. You know, do you want to solve air pollution with the private access only? No, it's not going to work. Or species losses, natural reserves. You need a common global common approach to such assets, right? This is one figure. The second figure is 85% to 90%. These are the Thomas Piketty data and the data from the UniCredit Wealth Report and others. Um, 85 to 90% of the wealth is already privatized and even unevenly privatized, but it's private. It's not public good. So do you really want to take private money only to mobilize, to fund the rest 15% of the public goods, to privatize the entire world for the next 100 years, with all the risks associated to it and all the uncertainties be hedged? This is going to be a world which is completely volatile, even more volatile than before. So I'm not saying that we are able to get rid of uncertainties fully, they will stay to some extent, right? But we can better manage uncertainties with a collective approach, not with a privatized approach only. You can see that in healthcare, you can see that universal education, you can see that in um, uh, hedging and reserving natural reserve, reserves and others. Um, this is why my argument is, if it comes to finance and transformative finance in the future, it's twofold. First, come up with smart instruments that hedge the risks and the uncertainties, the systemic risks and uncertainties, to mobilize the private sector trillions. We need them. I would say, for example, for climate change in Germany, 80, 90, 95% of the volume can be done by the private sector. They have a lot of cash flow. But what they need is not money for the project to be done, not subsidies. They need money to hedge the associated risks to the project. And this should be a public affair. This is one, one line, okay? Mobilizing the trillions and the hedging instruments. The second one is funding, managing, and enabling our commons, right? And then we enter the debate about healthcare and education and infrastructure and highways and natural reserves, etc. And here the debate is um, how much of that should be privatized and how much of that is better in better hands if it's a, it would remain a common good and for both ways. You know, for mobilizing the trillions and for funding the commons. Fiscal national policy will be not enough in speed and volume to provide the liquidity enough to do that. And this is why you need an expansive policy, an, expansive, an expanded uh, monetary policy by central banks and by regulators providing parts of the money to enable that shift. Uh, we have already witnessed such policy during the coronavirus mm -hmm. uh, period. 
but what is the outcome really is a huge debt on, yeah. on of of the particular countries. Yeah. So how would you solve this? Because well, uh, even more debt. Yeah. Let's look. Let's look at the debt issue on a country level within the eurozone, and then outside of the eurozone, and then for a developing country. And let's make a roll take into the position of a regulator or a central bank. Okay? A central bank can um, manage the monetary flow by three operations. One is the interest rate, right? The second one is they call up the private capital market and say, guys, we need some money. They call up the institutional investors and they are pr happy to provide money and buy state bonds. But they have a third option. And the third option is technically speaking what we call a quantitative easing. They can, as every sovereign state, the Polish state too, the EU Union too, create money out of its own. They don't have to call up the taxpayer first. They don't have to call up international capital private markets first. They can create money out of its own in order to partly solve the problem. Can I give you a concrete, a yep. concrete example out of the year 2000? During Corona, 2021, March 8th or 12th, we all, 2 o'clock in the morning, slept well, hopefully. Central bankers in the world didn't. You know, because you know what happened? A very small market at the capital market, it was so-called repo market, repurchasing agreement market. It's an interbanking refinancing market. It's a very small segment. Nobody is interested in that segment in public, right? Only the experts. But this repo market basically dried out within minutes and hours. And within minutes and hours, all central banks led by the Fed injected up to 1 million per second. Altogether, 1.5 to 1.7 trillion, American trillion, not the billions, the trillions, into that small segment in order to provide enough liquidity that on the other day in the morning, the interbanking sector was still able to operate properly. You probably know about this debate. It didn't make it to the New York prime time, but it was a substantial aspect happening during Corona that demonstrates that from a technical perspective, from a technical perspective, central banks do have monetary tools to overcome asymmetric shocks in the future and avoiding breakdowns of the system. And if you take that argument just for a minute, step back and say, okay, we are in the midst of a transformative, transformative process. There's huge costs ahead, huge costs ahead. Climate change, migration costs, uh, social externalities, environmental externalities. We all created already. Okay, the costs are not just hypothetical. They are out there already. They are basically, we're running towards them and they're exponential in part. Why not having central banks within their mandate? Within their mandate. It's basically Lisbon Primary Treaties 136, Chapter 2. And Lisbon Treaties, Primary Treaties 125, 26. Within that mandate, where central banks are supposed to look at the CPI, Consumer Price Index, saying, if you only look at the CPI, but see all these costs ahead already, we need you to act now to stay within your mandate, to provide liquidity to avoid an exponential growth of the inflation rate in the future. All right, but when it comes to this uh, uh, the money that are really uh, introduced uh, uh, by, the, by the central banks, the problem I think is that 
it, when it comes to interbank market, it was the mm, the aim was really clear. Yeah. When it comes to this environmental shift, not mentioning other S and G, mm -hmm. it's let's say it's less. We, we 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 cannot really touch this exactly. It's it, it's yeah. it, it, it's more like a cloud rather than than Absolutely. anything else. And I've got other question because uh, if we want to manage this issue globally, mm -hmm. do we need a special institution? Because, for example, not every central bank mm -hmm. could be interested in mm -hmm. uh, financing this problem. Yeah, yeah. Get, let's get very practical, right? Um, for our solution, tackling future asymmetric shocks, let's put it that way, right? Uh, seven, eight central banks' approvals are necessary, not 120. Because if you look at it from a currency perspective, with these six or seven central banks, 95% of all currency flows are covered anyway. And these seven to eight central banks, they meet anyway on a regular basis. Each of them have each of others phone number to call up, right? But I agree what you say that talking about the future, talking about climate is fuzzy. Talking about repo market is easy, okay? But the future is going to be fuzzy. It's not gonna go away. Climate problems are not a cyclical problem like business cycles of booze and busts. They will remain for the next two or three generations until the end of the century, at least, if not longer. So it's wise if you're a regulator and if your mandate is taking care of the CPI, okay, it's wise to consider more and more fuzzy problems and to internalize that in your political decision making because the problem is the problem. Whether it's fuzzy or whether it's simple, the problem stays with you whether you like it or not. You have to adjust the monetary policy towards the problem, not the problem you have to adjust to the monetary policy. <laughs> Only because repo market problems are easy problems doesn't mean that this is your only problem. Climate remains a complex problem. It's not going to go away. Uh, the, the problem with electronic money and yeah. the money that is issued by the central bank there are a lot of them. Uh, first of all, it can be used to control the citizens, really, and the society. Uh, then, uh, I think here, when we talk about uh, environmental targets, uh, if it's going to be, I don't know, done in a planned way, uh -huh. we should really quite clearly uh, identified wh which kind of activities are going to be financed mm -hmm. with 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 this additional money yeah 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 i for example gave you on a global level um the example of the, the additional capital costs you know uh, get make let's make it very clear very very concrete the seven largest central banks create additional liquidity which running through World Bank or special drawing rights of the International Monetary Fund or the African Developing Bank that basically hedge this additional capital costs, period. And then on a domestic level, on a domestic level, the politicians have to shift from brown to green. For sure, they have to do that job. And part of that job, we have to write off. And then we might end up with an extended balance sheet at the African Development Bank. Yes, but I'd rather live in a world with an extended balance sheet, but a soft, fuzzy problem, than the other way around. The fuzzy problem is still out there because it doesn't fit into my category of simple problems, and I have a very clean and nice balance sheet. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it's going to cost. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? It's going to be costful uh, exercise. Yeah, it's going to be an expensive exercise. exercise. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, mm. 
we talk uh, about big, really big issues like central bank, governments, big firms, really. But most of the GDP mm. is produced by small companies. Yeah. What about them? Because, for example, now we are uh, we have a new well, drafts of the European standard uh, for sustainability and sustainability reporting. Mm -hmm. There will be in some taxonomies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are, as I remember, thirteen drafts. And what about them? Because, for example, in many countries, small companies, smaller. Yeah. Uh, and middle enterprises could see uh, these new regulations yeah. uh, as a new um, obligation and certain boundary. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, we have the same debate in Germany. You know, the uh, 80, 85, 90 percent of all the jobs are basically created by small, medium-sized enterprises. It's the same here in Poland, right? Um, as of now, the ESG taxonomy only refers to about 6,000 firms in Europe. But in 2025, 26, the small also have to blend in and come up with uh, additional reporting, which is going to cost additional stuff to begin with. And, um, you know, I'm part of the debate, but I'm also honest to tell you, I support the debate, but Taxonomy and ESG is going to be a very, very small part of the solution, but not the solution, a very small part. I think for me, the big game changer uh, is the financial sector in general. And I described the two avenues where taxonomy can play a difference, yes, but it's at the end of the day incremental. I'm sorry. But financial system needs stability. Yeah. Yeah, some rules that are uh, like a standard. Yeah, and yeah. taxonomy. Yeah. maybe yeah. it's bad standard. Yeah. but yeah. still a standard. Yeah, yeah, it is. I so think maybe yeah. so. It's wha better. What is the alternative? Yeah, well, there is no real alternative. It's better to have uh, an incomplete standardized accounting than no accounting, right? Fair enough. Yeah. But we also have to think beyond stress tests and beyond. Excel sheet check boxes, which gives us the illusion of control and the illusion of stability, where the real world doesn't provide that stability because it's fuzzy and complex, right? And if we really try to go beyond the stress tests, beyond the taxonomies, beyond the ESGs, all of which are still important, all right? But they will remain incremental for the leverage and the paradigm shift required. If you go beyond that, we have to admit there's huge, fuzzy, complex shocks ahead. We cannot fully quantify, right? And we as a world community have to come up with financial instruments that fragment them, that slice them, that silos them, that partly privatize, but part also partly publicize them, and basically uh, um, puts them in smaller pieces. It's like a, you know, it's like an omnibus, which is running after you, or which is you're heading a big omnibus, and you just try to say, let's stop. What's happening here? You know, there's uh, the wheels and the windscreen and the motor. Can we differentiate here? And this is probably what's going to happen. This is what I'm in favor of. You know, we discussed that this afternoon with uh, Northern Africa. You know, uh, for Northern Africa, in order to reduce migration and the migra cost of migration, and uh, to provide people in Northern Africa a living in a long-term perspective, we need 550,000 kindergartens, preschooling. We need 5,000 hospitals and we need 500 universities, just roughly. And, you know, building a kindergarten is not rocket science, okay? And there's thousands of people unemployed 
But what they need is a job and a wage and a perspective to build the kindergarten. You know, in collaboration with Europe and the United States and Africa and, and China. But at its core, what they need, I think, is not the skill to build a kindergarten. Because the skill is there, more or less. But what they need is the liquidity that basically is injected into that site in order to build that kindergarten and all the other 50,000s up there. And to give the people in that region a perspective of saying, you don't have to sit in a boat and come over to Italy. We, as a European communion, we create monetary policy that enables us to create additional sustainability around us in the northern African Middle East zone, right? which is Euro-based, Euro-nominated based, right? And provides additional joint ventures between Euro states and Northern African states, and provides different forms of private and public sector instruments. I think this is the, cheap, the cheapest way to do it, beyond the political agenda. So uh, generally the taxonomy could be a kind of, uh, I don't know, the, 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 um, the way that really makes us uh, away from the, the solving the real problem. So this is what you are trying to say. No. So, so that that's generally we are focusing on this taxonomy and we think that because of the taxonomy, the money will go through the financial market to finance this mm -hmm. en environmental shift. But in reality, we are not going to achieve this, but only to be stuck in some regulatory framework. Regulatory framework yeah. that doesn't bring us really to, 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 to the change. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's good and bad. I think it's good that you fight for a universal standardization of accounting, really. Okay, to make projects comparable, make it scalable, make it transparent to avoid fraud and bribery and all that stuff. You know, it's really important. But we should be also important that that tool is really only a very small tool to create the leverage and the shift from fossil to green, right? It's, it's a tool, but it's a small tool. Yeah, but we're, let's come back to the global scale. Okay. Because uh, we are living in Europe, and we pay a lot of attention to this, mm -hmm. but truly uh, the pollution that comes from Europe is really relatively small. Mm -hmm. it just, you know, directly from the Europe. If uh -huh. we take mm -hmm. into consideration all other aspects that it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's more, more problematic. Mm -hmm. So the pollution really directly comes from other places. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So then uh, you mentioned this few central banks that can deal with this. Mm -hmm. But is it really possible to... To, 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 to coordinate to, all this? Yes, to coordinate all this yeah. stuff you know, globally? Yeah, yeah, I mean, let's differentiate between the initial question we started from. The initial question is, what is the game changer, right? And my argument was, it is by far the monetary and financial sector. I'm not arguing against other parameters, right? And I'm not arguing that technology and governance and taxation schemas are relevant. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we overlooked the financial sector in this whole game. We have to get in and bring in in the whole equation. If it comes to the 10% you're referring to, that Europe basically produces only 10% of the CO2 load, whereas we can regulate in one way or another, uh, but the other 90% are created somewhere else, we are not able to control at all, right? And the 10% don't make much of a difference because the 90% are happening somewhere else in the world, mainly in Asia, right? This, yeah. is, this is, I get your argument, yeah, yeah. right? It is wise to do two things. First of all, the shift from fossil to green is not only about CO2. It is also about air pollution and air um, uh, cleanness. 
So living in Europe and having clean air, regardless to the rest of the world, is a selection advantage. It is not only about CO2 levels you can measure, it's also about it's healthier. The shift is not only about CO2 level, it's also it's cheaper. And it's not only about CO2 levels, which happening all over the world, it's also creating more jobs. So even if you take the CO2 out of the equation fully or partly, you can argue by three or four arguments for getting rid of the fossil for other reasons. And this is the one part of the argument. The other part is, even if you only represent 10%, let's collaborate with the other 90% and tell them, look, we're doing it also for CO2 reasons, but not only for CO2 reasons, for other reasons, because we want a healthier population, higher longevity. Uh, we create a lot of jobs and it's cheaper. Uh, a solar panel is going to be cheaper if you make a total cost analysis compared to all the uh, um, environmental externalities of fossil industry. So if we can then, in the second way, convince other parts of the world, saying Europe is doing the right thing, uh, we are all together on the right track. However, I agree, if the rest of the world is not doing anything, let's assume, which is not the case, but let's assume. We run into something what economists call a green paradox, right? Because if we withdraw from the supply side the 10% of fossil, coal and oil, it's going to drop by 10% and the rest of the world is going to buy cheap oil and coal all over the world and even create more externalities for the rest of the world, right? So it's actually from a Comparative, competitive perspective, if you run a coal mine, it's actually good if Germany steps out because you can have cheaper fossil for quite a while, right? And this is the problem we're in. This is kind of the trap we're in called the green paradox. We want to do good, but we create bad. Yeah. All right, so uh, when we uh, are talking about this, uh, Mm, investors, especially the individual investors, mm. can you see any role for them? Because you know there there there's different approach. For example, in uh, uh, in uh, West uh, Western Europe, we've got um, a lot of uh, ESG products, and financial market is proud of it. When we look here in Eastern Europe, there are not a lot of them, and really the interest is very low. Yeah. So to what extent do you think this kind of um, attitude really is important? Should we really take care of it or when we talk about really the scale, we are talking about small amount of money, so let's forget it. Let's, let's do it something maybe more productive in, in, in monetary policy rather than to, yeah. you, to, to you know, to, to, to fight with, with, with uh, individual investors. Yeah, I mean, um, at its core you're referring to the dilemma of short-term versus long-term perspective, right? Short-term, you're right. Short-term, it's better to invest in a coal mine, in child labor, and into low social or governmental standards. Short-term. Long term, it's a shorter stick. You're going to lose the game. Okay, long term. So if you can shift your mindset towards a long term perspective, you're automatically on the right side of history. And in order to have enable that from short to long term, again, you need the public sector and the monetary sector to step in to hedge this maturity from short too long to some extent. I think, but you're right. I mean, you, you have here in Poland a specific situation where nuclear on one side and the coal mine industry has a very, very long tradition and has a big vote and saying in politics, right? And this will require still a long way to go, but it's worth it, the effort, because the future is green or none. 
the future is green or none, also for the kids and grandkids of the coal miner, right? And there will be sacrifices, yes, there will be forms of welfare losses in Poland and in Germany, all over the world, because we have to admit that we all created a mess. We all created a mess. We all had lunch, but now try to get away with the bill, if I may say in one word, okay? And somebody is going to pay that bill. And you as experts in accounting knows there is no free lunch. The question is not free lunch or full lunch. The question is, can we diminish the bill to some extent by creating smart financial instruments, allowing us to hedge parts of the costs ahead we cost already to begin with. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Oh, Thank wow. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for much. having me in your show and looking forward for a fruitful uh, afternoon with lecturing and exchange with the faculty members and the students. Thank you very much. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. It was a great pleasure. Marcin Kavinsky from the Department of Social Insurance. And Katarzyna kobila from the Department of Accounting. Thank you. Thank you.